everybody, and welcome into another edition of Cronkite Sports Live here in our downtown Phoenix studio. I'm Andre Sims. To my left is Nick Batters, and we have another great edition of Cronkite Sports Live planned for you. Nick, it's good to be up here with you. So glad to be here with you. The Bay Area to Cronkite Sports Live anchor pipeline is as strong as it's ever been. This is going to be a good show. I'm stoked. Absolutely. You know, if you look at the numbers, the Bay Area has been killing Southern California. And as far as anchors are yeah. concerned, there was a bit of some Love division it. there. And there's also some division between Tempe and Tucson. And the Arizona State men's basketball team took on the team from down south in Tempe last night. Let's get a look at the highlights. Remy Martin had himself a day. 31 points for the point guard leading the charge right away. U of A, though, they kept it competitive. They had themselves quite the day from behind the arc. Shot 14 of 28 in this one. 50% clip. That's what kept them in the game and ultimately forced the game to go into overtimes. Remy Martin drive in addition right there. He played incredibly well. He's fired up after this layup. The 9-4-2 crew was fired up as well. They filled the bank to capacity last night, so much so that they were turning people away. The game went into overtime, as I said, and where Arizona State took control. Remy Martin helped ice the game with some incredibly clutch free throws in overtime, and they outscored the Wildcats 12-5 in OT, and the final score was 95-88. Now, the win marks the first victory over the Wildcats in Bobby Hurley's career, and WCSN's Alex Gall was at Wells Fargo Arena last night and brings more insight about the win. It was a territorial cup finish for the history books as Arizona State edged the University of Arizona 95 to 88 in overtime. The game was marked by a number of fantastic individual performances, including 31 points from Remy Martin and 22 rebounds from Zylan Cheatham, both setting new career highs in those stats. It also marked Bobby Hurley's first win over Arizona in his four year tenure at Arizona State. It's uh, it hasn't sunk in, you know, what this means to me other than, you know, we got Another conference win, and we're six and three, and, and now we're moving on to next week. Remy was, was spectacular tonight, with uh, you know, especially with his with his shot making, his assists, his island again, over 20 rebounds. I mean, it's insane what he's doing out there for this team. And uh, before tonight, Bobby Hurley held a record of 0 and 6 versus the University of Arizona, but Hurley wasn't having any of that tonight. He brought his players out onto the court before the game, and he personally ran a sprint for every single point that ASU had lost by in their previous six matchups versus the Wildcats. He, he makes you want to go to war for him. I mean, he just, he pushes you to a new limit. Uh, he, he makes you feel like you're capable of more than you are. And like I said, we just try to come out and do our jobs. We did it for Coach Hurley and the staff. Um, it's personal, you know, and when it gets personal, um, it ups the, the level of intensity. And, you know, me loving Hurley, me loving the ASU community, um, and seeing what it's been through um, against U of A, is something that the team and I took upon ourselves to say, hey, why not take, make a turn in history and keep it like that? ASU has a full week off before taking on Washington State next Thursday right here at Wells Fargo Arena. But for now, reporting in Tempe, Alex Gall, Cronkite Sports. The women now have their shot at the Wildcats Friday at 6 p.m. And Charlie Turner Thorne's team is out for a little bit of revenge. When these two teams met on December 30th, Arizona State lost 51 to 39, putting up its worst scoring performance since February 2014. WCSN reporters Gareth Kwok and Jack Johnson were at the bank earlier this week to discuss the next contest in the Territorial Cup. For Arizona State, they only have one game this weekend, but it's a big one against rival University of Arizona. Alongside WCSN women's basketball writer Jack Johnson, I'm Gareth Kwok, and Jack, Arizona State only put up 39 points last time they faced the Wildcats back in December. What, do you, what, what should we expect from Arizona State this time around uh, on Friday? Yeah, you, you said it all right there with the 39-point number. Charlie Turner Thorne, she talked after practice today. She described going over the game tape in one word, and that word, Gareth, was brutal. It was really tough to go back over and look at a game where they scored a season low, 39 points. Kiana Ibis, the only player in double figures for that game, she only had 11. And again, this offense, they go through Kiana Ibis. Whenever she scores over 15 points a game, they tend to win in their losses, such as UCLA only scoring 10, Arizona only scoring 11, struggled a little bit against Stanford. If they get her going, then they should be in good shape on Friday. For Arizona, they have stellar guard Ari McDonald. She scored 24 points against Arizona State back in December, averaging 25.2 points per game this season. 
Jack, what's going to be the key for Arizona State's defense in order to stop McDonald? Yeah, she is impressive. A, a spectacular sophomore is Ari McDonald, but also Arizona State and their losses, they've struggled to contain the big players. Sabrina Unescu for Oregon, 31 points. Alana Smith, 25 points here in Tempe. Arizona State, they need to limit the best players' potential and they need to limit their scoring output. Simply put, Arizona had 51 points in that win over Arizona State and Ari McDonald had about half of them with 24. So if they can contain her under 18, 15 points, that would be optimal. Again, they're going to have this crowd in Tempe with them, so it'll give them a good chance. They're a great perimeter defending team, Gareth, and I think they'll have a good shot at it. All right, Jack, very quickly, what's your prediction for Arizona State versus Arizona? Well, if you're an Arizona State fan, you certainly hope to be over 39 points, and I think they will. They'll get the offense going as long as they get the ball to Keon Ibis where she needs it, and she scores over 18. Arizona State, they'll win, and they'll send this Tempe crowd home happy, split the season series against Arizona. I'm saying a final score, 65-59, to Arizona State. Well, there you have it. Arizona State versus Arizona tip off at 6 p.m. here from Wells Fargo Arena. Reporting from Wells Fargo Arena, Jack Johnson, Gareth Kwok, Cronkite Sports. While ASU basketball enters the middle of the Pac-12 schedule, Sun Devil Softball is gearing up for its first tournament of the season, the Kajikawa Classic, starting on February 8th. And this year's team looks quite different from last year's group that made it to the Women's College World Series. And for more, I'm going to bring in WCSN softball reporter Troy Tauscher. And Troy, like I mentioned, a lot of changes between this year's team and last year's team. What would you say are maybe some of the most notable differences between the two squads? Well, I think the biggest difference when you look at these rosters is the pitching staff. Last season, ASU had four pitchers, three of whom played a lot and really helped them in some tight situations when their offense wasn't getting well. This season, they're returning zero pitchers. Two of them graduated and two of them made the decision to transfer for other programs. So that pitching staff is going to look very different, and they lost a lot of veteran experience there. And then the other loss they're really going to feel is Danielle Gibson. She was a star at first base in her freshman year, but she's now playing for Arkansas, and she led the team in home runs, played great on offense and defense. So between her loss and the massive overhaul of the pitching staff that helped them a lot, they're going to really feel both of those uh, this season, and they're going to have to find ways to adjust. So you mentioned a couple of really key losses and a whole lot of new faces, too. Who do you think can maybe step up to fill some of those shoes that might be missing? Well, on the pitching staff, you got to look at Cielo Meza. She's a redshirt junior transfer from Long Beach State, and she's going to be probably the most important pitcher on this squad. She was nominated for the or the player of the year award watch list, excuse me. But on offense, the best player that they're going to have and the player is going to need to step up the most is probably Danae Chapman. She was a standout towards the end of her freshman season last season. Nine home runs on the season, most of those coming in the latter half. So she got really hot towards the end once she started getting more playing time. And the thing about her is her swing is still very raw and there's still a lot to work on with her form. So the fact that she's already able to go yard with a swing that's not that polished speaks great volumes to her power and the the more she works on her swing and improves her fundamentals, her numbers are going to go through the roof if she's able to work on those aspects of her game. It might be safe to say Danae Chapman, one of the most underrated players of last year's team. And looking at years past, the softball in the Pac-12 has been absolutely incredible. You look at the Women's College World Series, a handful of teams from the Pac-12. So the league's been dominant for a long time. What does it look like in 2019? Like you said, the league has been dominant for a long time. This season, a little bit less dominant, though. Four teams in the top 25 preseason poll. You see their UCLA, Washington, U of A, and ASU. People still believe in them, even though they lost arguably two of their best players. They're in there at number 12, and they're receiving votes. You have Cal, Oregon, and Oregon State. And Oregon is definitely one of the teams to watch in this conference because if you think ASU has had issues with its transfers, Oregon has had it way worse. They've lost several players. They're fielding a roster that's very, very small, and I think they're going to have a lot to adapt to, but they're still receiving votes, and I think that's just because people really believe in Pac-12 softball. They've consistently been dominant, consistently been sending teams to the College World Series, and I think you get a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, even in years like this where the conference doesn't look quite as strong. Conference of Champions in softball, the Pac-12. Really exciting stuff to look forward to this year. Troy, thank you so much for coming on to follow ASU softball content starting next week and running all season long. Head over to CronkiteSports.com. ASU wrestling has gone through a gauntlet of a schedule in the month of January. The program has been on, a, on the road for every match since the 11th, playing in Virginia, Oregon, and Pennsylvania in that order over the last three weeks. Zeke Jones and his squad have the final road match of this stretch tomorrow. The number 23 Sun Devils head to Palo Alto to take on conference for Stanford at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. After that, the Sun Devils head home where they'll wrestle on their home mats for the first time in almost a month. 
when Missouri comes to town. Now switching gears to the other Olympic sport to call Wells Fargo Arena home, the number 19 Gym Devils fell to number four Utah Red Rocks in Tempe over the weekend. In the latest installment of one of the Pac-12's oldest gymnastics rivalries, the Gym Devils fought hard but couldn't keep pace with a talented Red Rocks squad. And WCSN's own Tyler Mannion was there to cover all the action. Coming off their best performance of the young season, the Arizona State Gym Devils hosted National Powerhouse Utah on Saturday. The Utes brought the heat as usual, led by former Olympian Michaela Skinner. But the home team put up a fight early. Arizona State started out hot on vault and bars. But as they moved to the balance beam, which is normally their best event, they struggled as not a single Gym Devil earned a 9.8 or higher. We were a little off. They, I think we just had a, a little bit of, you know, that little bit of doubt creep in. You know, they just, they, they didn't, we talked about, you know, we need aggressive beam. We need you to go out there and be confident. It wasn't quite there, and I think it showed. So, uh, obviously, you know, I mean, four days ago, it was a whole different story. So, they're, they're capable of way more. We just got to go out and put all four events together in the same night, and, you know, then we'll be really happy with it. Saturday was also ASU's first test without senior Caitlin Lentz, who was injured last weekend at UCLA and is lost for the season. Jay and Jess are very serious about having like the 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 people being ready. So it wasn't like hard just being able to throw someone out there. Like of course it was hard because Caitlin got injured, but other than that, like we handled it pretty smoothly. After the struggles on beam, Leonard Baker and company flipped back on track with the floor exercise. Kyra herself posting a near-perfect 9.95 and the rest of the team following suit to post a season-high score on the event. At the end of the day, the Gym Devils earned their second-highest score of the season in the loss, but know the only way to go from here is up. In Wells Fargo Arena, Tyler Mannion, Cronkite Sports. On Saturday, Arizona State Baseball's Phoenix Municipal Stadium played host to Dingers in the Desert, a fundraiser for Project 34, an organization that was co-founded by former Sunnyvale baseball players Corey Hahn and Trevor Williams. Project 34 supports those whose lives changed due to spinal cord injuries. Hahn saw his life change forever in February 2011. That was his freshman season at Arizona State, when he slid headfirst into second base and suffered a spinal cord injury that left him paralyzed from the chest down. Williams was also a freshman at the time. Han now, now works in the front office of the Arizona Diamondbacks, and Williams will begin his fourth season on a major league roster with the Pittsburgh Pirates in 2019. The event itself was a home run derby first, a youth competition, then round three of an ongoing battle between ASU's Spencer Torkelson and Carter Aldretti. Torkelson won this time, but Aldretti still leads the season series 2-1. Finally, there was the pro portion, which included former Sun Devil Drew Stankiewicz and major leaguers Scott Kingery and Matt Davidson. Former Arizona Wildcat and current Boston Red Sox prospect Bobby Dahlbach won that round. At this stage in the season, every game is crucial for ASU men's hockey. The Devils have sat in the top 15 in the country for a while, but still find themselves on the bubble as they look to secure their first postseason berth in the brief history of the program. Recently, the team hit the road to take on the storied Boston University Terriers, and WCSN's Riley Trujillo made the trip and recaps the weekend. The number 16 Sun Devil men's hockey team returns to Tempe this week after a huge series split at Boston University. The Devils faced great adversity in their first game, resulting in a loss to the Terriers, which later fueled their dominant play in the second matchup, where they were able to bring home a 3-0 win. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an awesome win for our group, especially after that first night. Uh, we felt like we played pretty well, but just, you know, didn't come out on top and a couple bounces didn't go our way. but. Um, you know, so now we came into it knowing that, knowing that it's probably uh, probably a must win, and um, we treated it like a, like that way, and um, you know, really proud of our group and the way we competed. Coach Greg Powers said that the win on Saturday night was one of the team's best 60-minute performances this season, and that it should be the standard for the remaining games. Well, I mean, what I told the guys after our game Saturday was that's the standard that that they have to hold each other accountable to moving forward for these last six games. And, and it's on them. They know what they need to do to be successful um, at this point in the season with what we have to play for and what's in front of us. We did it on Saturday with an unbelievable 60-minute effort. Um, and it's on them to do it again this Friday. The Devils are traveling to face the Rochester Institute of Technology for a two-game series, one of only three remaining series left in the regular season. Unbelievable building and fan base. This is going to be a big time series for us and, and we're, uh, we're excited about it. In Tempe for Cronkite Sports, 
Riley Trujillo. What do you say, Andre? Time to have some fun? Let's do it. My favorite way to have fun is to go to Twitter. And to talk Twitter, we're going to bring in a Bay Area legend. Um, I'm going to stop you right there. Not only is he a Bay Area legend, but he is a fellow St. Mary's College High School alum. Alex Rodia, good to have you. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been a great week in social media for Sun Devils. I'm here to bring you the best of it. Let's kick things off with our own Eliov Goodbye. He tweeted out earlier this week at the presser before the U of A game, Zylan Cheatham with a mic drop to end it. He goes, you can't spell Arizona without the Z. Now, you know, from I respect the confidence there. It is incredibly obvious. That is, I don't even know how I would pronounce Ariona. I don't know. Point being, it would be weird, but if you're going to mic drop like that walking out of a press conference, you better back it up. 22 boards is the way to do it. Absolutely. The second tweet's coming from a bit more newsworthy. It's cold outside, guys. It is cold, and 75% of continental United States is going to endure below freezing. It's going to be I cold. It's going to be cold in Rochester. So ASU Hockey was like, hey, you guys want to come out here? Sadly, they said no, but, I mean, couldn't help but try. As someone who grew up in the Bay Area and now goes to school at Arizona State, I didn't know that purple color was, like, actually a thing until seeing this tweet. Like, yeah, no, the, absolutely. The, the colors get that cold. Yeah, honestly, really? like, I'm all for, like, home ice advantage, but, like, if I was the hockey team, I would have been, like, jumping all over this. Like, you give me a chance to go from, like, negative 20, whatever it is, in New York right now, and... To like Come 75. out to 70, 75, like I palm feel bad trees. I for Arizona State hockey this week, I'm going to be honest. Absolutely. Honestly. This third tweet is a mix of two tweets, actually. It's been a rough week for ASU coaches. I mean, first Bobby Hurley <laughs> getting nailed in the face by a ball, and he does what he does best. He goes and chews out a ref afterwards. I mean, look at that. Pokes out straight to the face. God. Ah. Honestly, I... I respect Bobby Hurley for just sticking true to his form. Secondly, we have Zeke Jones earlier oh. this week getting demolished by his oh own owns player. Look at Zahid. <laughs> Look at him right oh here. That God. is everybody looking at that tweet. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. I just want to... One more time. Oh. oh. I just want to point out that Zahid and I both instinctually <laughs> made the same face in reaction to that. Ugh. And that is, that is honestly impressive. But Absolutely. you got to have some more spatial awareness there if you're that wrestler. Yeah, I no. I feel like, to, 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 to add to this, I feel like that's the reaction Greg Powers would have if he were standing on the bench for an ASU hockey game. He was, like, yeah. nailed, by a, nailed by a puck in the, in the mouth. He'd, he'd, he'd kind of just do that. that chew it out a little bit. There, chew it out a little bit, maybe spit out a little blood and just keep coaching the rest of the game like Absolutely. he Absolutely. Honestly, I don't think I – if I got leveled like Zeke Jones did in that <laughs> one, I, I might stay down for a while. But oh, excellent yeah. work, as always. The Thank you. St. Mary's College High School production on WCSN is rivaled only by that of St. Ignatius in San Francisco. Still Bay Area, though. Still Great Bay work Area. as always. Thank you. Now we switch gears now to our impact segment where Jacob Rudner brings us something a little bit related to Arizona State football. Thanks, guys. The state of Arizona has long been fruitful picking for college football recruiters. Players grow up in the strong high school systems of the state, crack ESPN's top 300, and notoriously, they leave. It's funny almost. A state with two Power 5 football programs reaps just a fraction of the benefits of the in-state high school talent. Herm Edwards is hoping to change that. A few weeks ago, Arizona State announced that they were hiring former Chandler High School football coach Sean Aguano to the staff. Sure, Aguano is a fantastic football coach, but to Edwards, he is more than that. He's a recruiting chip. Aguano has the ability to join a program on the rise and recruit heavily on in-state talent. A state that has called itself home to talent like Brian Lewerke, Kyle Allen, Brett Hundley, and Everson Griffin. The commonality between all of them, they left to play outside of Arizona. Aguano brings to the table the ability to change the landscape of the Pac-12. Should he bring in more homegrown football players, the combination of his recruiting and that of Edwards' national recruiting could be enough to catapult the Devils atop an already weakened conference. So when Herm opted to bring in local high school coaching, he was setting a trend, recruit, recruit locally. Herm did it in Aguano, and he is hoping his new coach will do the same. If it works, the Pac-12 could be changed for a long time to come. Thanks so much, Jacob. Number 15, Arizona State women's hockey hosted number 10, Minnesota, this past weekend, dropping both games by scores of 5-1 to one and 6-1, to one, respectively. On Friday night, Finn Larson scored against her hometown team, and goaltender Jordan nash Bolden faced 58 shots in the four-goal loss. The Gophers continued to pound the net Saturday, taking 62 shots on freshman goalie Macy Eide. Freshman Abby Steinman scored her second goal of the season, ASU's lone tally on the morning. 
The Sun Devils are off this weekend, but wrap up the regular season next weekend at home against rival Grand Canyon. Both games will be streamed at Facebook.com slash Cronkite Sports. Join myself and Reed Harmon on the call. Excellent stuff, Nick. Looking forward to that. And now we switch gears to one of our favorite segments here on the show, The Way It Is. Everyone knows the drill at this point. It's season 11 of this show. We're going to ask each other some questions, debate a little bit back and forth, and at the end, one of us gets to rant. So, Nick, I'll start us off. ASU basketball beat U of A last night in overtime. But in Tempe is one thing, Tucson is another. What should be the focus for topping the Wildcats down south? This is going to sound super basic, but I think, it, I think it's defense. We saw what Arizona did yesterday with only a small portion of their talent. So if ASU wants to have any chance in Tucson next week, they're going to not only need to shore up their defense over the next few weeks, but also really bring the defense down to Tucson. Yeah, I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to say free throws. Free throws actually proved to be a benefit for Arizona State last night. Remy Martin icing the game in overtime, hitting clutch free throw after clutch free throw. And that's something that's plagued the Devils this season. And if they're going to win in Tucson, the free throws have to keep falling. No, you're absolutely right. Now moving over from the court to Farrington Stadium, ASU softball. We talked about it earlier in the show with Troy, but they lost two of their best players from last season, Daniel Gibson, G. Wars, but they're still coming into this season ranked number 12 in the nation in the preseason poll. So do you think they're going to live up to the height despite those two key losses? This might be a hot take, but I'm going to say yes. Okay. Obviously, you see the number that they're losing on paper, and that is huge. G. Wars is one of the most dominant arms in the country, but unlike in prior seasons with Arizona State, there's some like there's some solid coaching here. Trisha Ford has got her team motivated and buying into what she is preaching, and I think that's going to be huge. No, I think you're right. Trisha Ford, I was a little concerned about the clubhouse when those departures were going on, but I think this season's going to be good. The two transfer pitchers they brought in are, are not at all untalented. They're going to be very fun to watch in the circle this season. And on top of that, you have Danae Chapman at first base. She's, she's no Danielle Gibson, but she put up great numbers in a short time, so I'm excited to see what she's capable of. Plus, the entire starting lineups are turning for softball, so I think they're going to be in good shape. Yeah. Last but not least, look, it's cold. Yeah. We have covered that very much on this here. show. It is warm here, but it is cold pretty much everywhere else. So if you had to be snowed in with one Arizona State head coach, who would it be? There, there are two that come to mind for me. Both are coaches that I've had good conversation with. One, Lindsay Ellis of the ASU women's hockey team. I always have a great time talking hockey with her. But Mike Early, the ASU baseball coach, I am down to talk with him at any point. He is a fantastic mind for hitting. He's just fun to talk to, and if I'm snowed in, that's who I want to talk to. Yeah, this might be a basic answer for me, but I'm going herd members. I had the chance to talk to him for 15 minutes working on a story last semester, and his brain, there was a lot, a lot of knowledge in his brain. I would love to be able to sit down and talk with him for hours. That's fair. Now we're going to see who wins. I think both of us only have one win in our, the way it is career, so I'm, I'm curious to see how this is going to end up. I feel pretty confident, but... <sighs> you know what? It's been a long time coming. Shout out to the people in the production room right now. I appreciate it. And so... Unlike most people working on the show today, I was a student the last time ASU beat U of A in basketball. It happened my freshman year when the Wildcats were ranked number two in the country, and the entire university went nuts. The 942 crew stormed the court, and Herb Sendek and thousands of his closest friends celebrated that game like they'd won the national title. Fast forward four years, and under a new regime, Bobby Hurley and company have summited a mountaintop that ASU just seemed like they wouldn't get over. But there is a difference in last night's win versus the one that only myself and our director, Bobby Krause, were around to see. Sure, there were high emotions, as there are with any rivalry, but that was it. No court storming or anything. For the first time in years, the Sun Devils were the favorite and going in and lived up to it. I recently read an article in The Athletic about how Ray Anderson and his staff knew Hurley was their guy almost immediately, and it's proving to be the right decision. Bobby Hurley has been slowly building a winner in his tenure. Recruiting has improved, the culture has changed, and the results are following. ASU expects to win now, which is a testament to the, what Hurley and his staff have done. And that's the way it is. All right, it's time to head into top plays, and we had some really good plays in the last week. This was a tough decision. The top three plays from Arizona State's athletics in the last week. And we're going to start off in Boston. Boston University, Agnes Arena. Brinson Pashnook, he brought ASU within one goal. Look at him go. What a goal it was. That brought the score to 3-2. to two. ASU did go on to lose to the Terriers 4-2, to two, but it was a very close effort. What a goal from Brinson Pashnook. Game two over the weekend for ASU hockey. Joey Decord, glove save on his belly. That's impressive. I couldn't do that if you gave me a million tries. My goodness, that set the tone in that one. That was in the first period. His seventh shutout of the year. Andre, that was great, but we have our top play. It's last night. ASU, Arizona, look at him go. Zylan Cheatham, holy cow. 
unbelievable. The first time in three years ASU beats Arizona. Zylan Cheatham, that man is unreal. Only 11 points in that game, but that is what an, what an emphatic way to score two of them. That atmosphere, raucous all night, 14,000 plus in Wells Fargo. I'm going to be honest, I think those are three of the most impressive top plays I have ever seen. Two incredible hockey plays, plus one of the most exciting moments of the ASU basketball season. Incredible. Absolutely. You know, top plays unparalleled. This show also, I'm going to go ahead and say it, unparalleled content from us as well. Absolutely, no doubt. This is a great show. Andre, thank you so much for each and every one of you that joined us on this Friday evening. Thank you as well. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Until then, enjoy your February. Thank <laughs> you.